Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 313 for Monday, July 19th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How are things for you in Napomo, my friend? <clears throat> it's a nice day today, and uh, <laughs> I got my two end of the week going out for two final gigs with my beloved friend Steve Strom, my bass player right. of 20 years. Right. So it's going to be an emotional week. Yeah. We're going <laughs> to. We're going to take him out after the first gig because that's the earlier of the two gigs. And so yeah. the second gig may be a little loose. <laughs> Might be a little rough. <laughs> <laughs> loose and rough. <laughs> yeah, I know what that can be like. Yeah, I think we all know what that can be like. All right. Well, you know, it's good. Have fun. That's, um, that's, a, he's, you've been, and it's not like your friendship needs to end, but it, it, will, oh, no. evolve, it will evolve because you're not going to just naturally see each other on a regular basis. So, yes. Yes. You know, and, and we wish him, well, in his new home, in his new state, it's, uh, you know, so many reflections of, of an amazing, you know, we built this thing. He's, he, he's right. the longest tenured guy in the rhythm section. And, you know, and I've, I gushed about him last time about what a great guy he is and what a great musician he is. And, and uh, you know, I just, these should be two celebratory gigs because we've accomplished a lot together and he's accomplished a lot. His reputation is is golden is one of the best players in, in this town. So <clears throat> we're just going to celebrate. We're going to have a good yeah. time. I, I did promote it as, you know, fans should come say goodbye to Steve, which he hasn't even announced, you know, oh. and he's just not that way. Right. right but, um, right, right, you know, right. I, I want him to, I want him to ride out on a white horse, you know, with all the love you can possibly get. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and like you said, he, uh, you know, wherever he's going, is going to, I forget what you said. Did you say Michigan? Is that where he's headed off to? Yep, Northern, right? Peninsula, Northern Peninsula, Michigan. They're getting a good bass player out there, man. That's, uh, yep. yep, that's pretty good. Uh, man, I got a lot to go through. We all we have a lot to go through. You know what I want to do is back two episodes ago, we answered Raymond's question, uh, giving some ideas, advice about the uh, line arrays that he should use or a PA that he should use for his small acoustic act. And he brought up one that I'm sort of embarrassed that uh, that we didn't. And, and I'm embarrassed only because I know about it because Mike and Fling owns two of these. Uh, Raymond wrote, he said, uh, thanks for all the info. After a visit gu to Guitar Center, I found the Evolve uh, EV30 and 50 arrays with built in 6LR channel mixers. The sales guy at Guitar Center said all the pro sound guys are going with QSC powered speakers and a Yamaha mixer or equivalent. Uh, I would also need to get monitors. What do you think of that setup? Hoping to hear from your listeners and other uh, and others. Yeah. So those Evolve 30 M's are. Uh, I have not used mics yet, but he bought two of them during pandemic, and and they have uh, already been promoted to be the default mains for fling gigs uh, going mm. forward. And it sounds like there might actually, like you mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, there might actually be a fling gig happening. But uh, in September, in fact, it's definitely happening. Uh, we'll be debuting a lot of uh, a lot of songs that we've been recording now. But yeah, those 30 M's, I mean, they're not inexpensive. You know, our, our discussion on those uh, a couple of weeks ago evolved in evolved, no pun intended, uh, into talking about less expensive gear because we found those Knox line arrays, which I'm still eager to test out. But um, but yeah, these E30s. Um, uh, or 30 M sorry. I've heard good things about. So it's yeah. such a hot sector that so many people have gotten in like Bose created it. And you know, it's interesting. I, I bought the first generation, second generation, third grade, yeah. at, you know, for acoustic and very small combos for small rooms. Although if you follow the Bose community pages, they'll, you know, talk about how they scale, you know, for one system or two systems. And, and uh, it, it's interesting, but you know, there's, Name brand manufacturers, EV being one of them, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, they, they're all in this. I, I don't think there's been an, like a exhaustive shootout of all of them side by side. That, not that I've seen. Ah, uh, 
like, yeah, I would Dave, like to get s- on that. Yeah, I'll get, I got to get on that. Yeah. Yeah. My, and now my free time really a year ago would have been the time to do this. Right. You know, but this thing, I, I did not realize in fact, until Raymond's email, because I haven't seen mics yet that these 30 M's have six XLR inputs. That's a big deal for, yeah, for this product category. Right. Like, yeah. And one of them, it, there are four, that are mono inputs. And then there's one that's a stereo input, uh, which is, I mean, it just like that blows away everything else I've seen. Most of them have at most two built into the the thing. And then, like you said, with the bows, you know, you can add on to it and have the mixer. Well, you're $600 to add four channels, yeah. which would give you six channels or, you know, $900 to add eight channels. That's what I'm saying, man. So yeah, it's Again, fascinating. I think it's all in the sound because I am so sold on this tone match stuff about, mm. you know, how it just really, for people who don't know how to EQ their own stuff, right? These presets are just yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we, um at the Chafed gig, so I played, I was supposed to have, if we had had this conversation a week ago, uh, I would have told you that I had four gigs this past weekend, Thursday, Friday, and then two on Saturday. As it turned out, I only had two on Saturday. The Thursday gig wound up getting canceled because somebody in the band wound up having a commitment that needed to wind up canceling the gig. And then uh, Friday's gig evidently had been, it was supposed to be monkey fist at the football field. uh, And evidently that had been canceled a month and a half ago. I just didn't get the memo. So I, I, I'm sure I turned down something for that night, but it was okay. It was nice to, you know, have the, have the night off. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but we played about doubles. So I played a double on Saturday. <laughs> I played. I mean, good, just in general, how does your body feel about doubles now? You know, so <laughs> good question. Um, I've played a couple of doubles, but this summer, but thus far it's been, you know, a one setter in the afternoon, like early afternoon. And then a one setter in the evening. This week was a one setter early afternoon and then a full like three and a half hour gig uh, high energy show at night. And I, I was fine with it. I, but going into it, I was like, wait a minute. Like, uh, I haven't done this in a long time cause you know, pandemic. So how's the old body going to hold up tonight? Mm. <laughs> but it was great. Like I was, I felt good. I, I ate quite a bit of CBD before I went to bed to make sure that I, I didn't wake up like stiff and unable to move. But otherwise like, I was, I was, that was a preemptive strike. It wasn't, you know, like, oh my gosh, I can't move. Um, I was tired the next day, but it was, I mean, it was fine. Yeah. It worked out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. The, ch- the chafed gig, uh, I'll go in reverse order. The, um, <laughs> the chafed gig, it had been six years since chafed played a gig and six really? years. Yes. <laughs> um, it, it, it was a, it sort of came together. Matt, uh, our guitar player, Matt Langley was booked to play Saturday night as a solo act uh, at uh, at the Gaslight, which is a club down in Portsmouth. And I don't know, a month ago, the booking agent called him, Paul Costley, who we have on the show here, uh, or had a couple of years ago on the show here. Paul called him and said, hey, you know, with pandemic sort of evolving here, especially here in New Hampshire, you know, uh, we're moving all the Saturday night things to full bands can you put a full band together or do I need to get a different band and, and move you inside? And so Matt quickly texted all the uh, members of chafed and was like, Hey guys, I have an opportunity. And so four of us were able to do it. Our, our guitar player, Jimmy, uh, our rhythm guitar player, I should say, Jimmy wasn't able to make it, but it, it worked out fine. And actually our friend, Jim Richardson wound up sitting in for the second set and, uh, and playing rhythm guitar with us. So, so that part of it worked out. Um, it was, you know, a little bit crazy. The, the, that was the club where they, they had all the new rules and everything. And I, I went in, as I said, I would without any, you know, without any attitude. And you know what? It worked out totally fine. Everybody was cool. And it was just mm-hmm. like it ever was. The rules are there because people have done stupid things and they want to be able to point at the rules and say, you're doing a stupid thing. Here's how it's, here's how it has been fixed already. But no, the, the staff was great. The management was great. The crowd was great. But it was the same crowd that I always remembered with chafed gigs. It's been a long time, but it's always, um, you know, it, it, well, and the gaslight's sort of the perfect match for this because the gaslight is definitely a meat market uh, where, you know, people come to, to find each other. I've, I've always said there's, there's the two F's 
uh, at meat markets and you get one of you get one or the other people either come to fight or they come to find love. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes both. Uh, no, that's the thing is I rarely see both, right? Like the, I, and I'm so, I'm sure they, you know, both happens at the fight clubs, but uh, the, the gaslight is most definitely not a place where people even have any interest in fighting with each other. Everybody's just there for a good time. And, uh, and it was, it was in, what the, the most interesting part was that my family was there and it reminded me of a conversation I had with a friend of mine, Ron Marks, guitar player, great guitar player, probably 25 years ago. He was playing in a band in Austin called Dysfunction Junction. And, uh, and you know, they played a lot of these kind of gigs for these meat market crowds. And he said, you know, if I ever have kids, and neither one of us had kids at this point, he said, I would want to bring, especially if I had a daughter, he's like, I'd want to bring my kids to a gig like this just to watch how people behave from the viewpoint of a spectator, right? You know, he's cause on stage we are spectators of the crowd, yeah. you know, and, and you see things differently than you do when you're in the crowd. Usually I do, you know, yeah. and, and, and he said, you know, cause some of these people, it like, it's amazing what they will do. And, and like there were women to the side of the stage grabbing uh, our, our guitar player's ass Right. Like, I mean, it, and it was just like, this is the vibe at this place. It's, it's all sort of normal. Uh, most gigs I've played there, someone has like, you know, flashed their, their top, a woman, will, you know, remove their top and flash the band or something like that. And it's just that kind of a vibe. And he was like, I, you know, I really would want my, my kids to see that so that they see what they would look like if they were to choose to do those sorts of things. And so it was great to have, have my daughter actually able to see that and, and it was what was really nice is this is a club where the crowd pretty much can go around the entire stage. Uh, certainly there are people camped out any like there's like a 270 degree, you know, thing where people will be and then they can walk directly behind me and within a foot of me, you know, which is a little weird. And the nice part was my my family was sitting so off to stage left house, right of me. And so it was almost like having them on side stage, which sort of protected us from it being, you know, crazy people right there. But there was a bachelorette party. There was a wedding. There were two birthdays. There was a woman from LA who made us play LA woman. And it was like every other chafed gig that we've ever played where we had, we came in with a set list. In fact, I came in with a really kind of hard and fast set list. Cause we, I had not seen our bass player in four years. You know, so like, <laughs> like there, there was no way we did not rehearse. Right. And so, uh, it, it was like, we got to stay on the, got to stay on the list, got to stay on the list. And that lasted for three songs, which is, you know, a record for chafed. And then we were off the, uh, off the map and, uh, just going with requests and whatever Maddie came up with. And it went great. It was fine. Like the band played well and, and everything went well, but it was interesting to see people behaving, you know, like people. Again, it had been a while since I'd seen that sort of thing for an extended period of time, but it was fun. I mean, it, like I said, that, that place never feels dangerous. It just feels a little crazy. And that's how every chafed gig was ever. So it was kind of uh, nice to revisit I mean, that, which is fun. You know, Yeah, we have, there's one club that we played that is kind of consistently like that. And I think I told you when I first started the band, we got a gig, but it was a year of Wednesday night, nine thirty right. to one thirty, with a lot of guys <laughs> having to go to work the next day. Yeah, and uh, and that was the, you know, some days we'd be playing to eight people, sometimes we'd be playing to fifty people. Sure. But yeah. In general, that's that's the mystique of that place. That's the stuff that happens often at that place. Yeah. Yeah. Getting flashed. You know. No. Yeah. No fights. Nope. That's great. But that's they do good. actually have a pretty good bouncer. You know, that is very. Very, uh, it's not a huge place, so he's he's omnipresent, right? That's good. And uh, yeah, and so I haven't seen a fight, but I've definitely seen people behaving badly or or well. If I guess if that's it, the it, thing, yeah, right? that's I, as I was coming up for like what to say, people behaving. I was like, well, it's like people because people I, behaving like people, they're behaving like people. Yeah, but not bad, not not you know objectively badly like the fighting. There was one club, I think we played their last, their final weekend. And this was, you know, with Fling probably six or seven years ago. Uh, this club called The Page, right around the corner from the Gaslight in Portsmouth. So, like, you know, literally the same pool of people from which to draw. 
And this place was just fights all night long. I, it like it was, it felt dangerous in there. I felt unsafe. Even as we were trying to load out, like there's two guys fighting. It was like, all right, step back up on the stage, let them go by, you know, with their thing. And, uh, unfortunately a week later, there was a week after we played there, there was a fight where, um, somebody wound up, uh, eventually dying from what happened in the fight. I think they were oh, put geez. into a coma and yeah, it was awful. Uh, needless to say the gig, we had two more gigs scheduled there and that, that, you know, we, we had canceled them before they canceled them, but the club shut down and, and has not existed since. But, um, but yeah, it's like, I've seen it. Like I didn't see that, that particular altercation, but there were probably three or four fights at this place throughout a, you know, three set night or something. It's crazy. Speaking of fighting people, um, <laughs> we set up with bitter pill and it, we was a last minute. The, the gig wasn't last minute, but things were running behind. We were supposed to play at noon 30 on Saturday. This was the early gig in the day. And this, uh, the, the previous thing, which was like kids performing some songs. It was a, a festival out in a park down in Exeter, New Hampshire, uh, just kind of an all day festival. I think it started at like 11, it goes till four or something. There's, you know, vendors and music and food and crafts and, you know, people. And it's a really nice little setup. And, and we this is the second one we've done there this summer. And so we get there, we couldn't get really started setting up until 1210 because things ran late. They'd only carved out a half hour of, of transition time, which probably wouldn't have been enough anyway. Uh, but we wound up getting set up. We were probably playing within about 40 minutes of, of that other thing ending. And that meant, you know, getting all our stuff on the stage, doing all the line checks, you know, getting everything. There's, they had a, a sound engineer for the day, a very qualified sound engineer. Thank goodness. Uh, that helped get everything, but you know, it's a lot to do. So we were in a rush and it was the first gig in a long time that I've played where there was no break between you start bringing your stuff on stage and now you play the downbeat. Like there was no break to pee before we took the, before we started the set. It was just like, we just rolled in and that was a little weird to just like, it, I don't know that we ever settled into the the gig, but one reason for it was, you know, we got everything going Line checks start happening. We do the kick drum, the snare drum, the toms, like, you know, most engineers like to do. And then he has me play the kit. And then we moved on to like, I don't know, I think banjo was next or bass was next or something. And this guy comes like, like storming over uh, straight up to our engineer who is, you know, just out in the, in front of the stage with his iPad. Cause that's how you mix things these days. And he starts screaming at the die. I paid taxes here. This is too loud. You have to turn it down. And, and the engineer was like ready to go. I was like, oh, no, no, this is bad. <laughs> and so Bill, Billy is at the front of the stage. He steps down. He's like, guys, 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 this is not the way to handle this. Uh, he, you know, he, he, he starts explaining to the guy who's screaming and yelling, look, this, he's not the one to talk to. And he's like, well, he's the one in charge. And he's like, yeah, but he's just being paid. He's doing what he's being paid to do. You got to talk to the people that organized this. And thankfully at that point that one of the organizers came over and, and this guy again starts in with, I pay taxes here. I live right there and you should come to my house and feel my windows. And it's like, yeah, you bought a house right next to a public park, like, <laughs> you know, and it's 1230 on a, on a Saturday afternoon. It's not like midnight 30 on a Wednesday or something like, dude, it's, it's going to happen. Like chill. Mm. And this was been on the schedule. Like, you could have gone out of town. You could have gone somewhere else for the day. If this really, it was clear that he woke up that morning knowing what looking he was going to do. Yeah. yeah. No, not, not just looking for a fight. He was going to pick this fight. Cause evidently he yeah. picked a similar fight on Thursday at the same park. And so, uh, I think they filed a police report on him, but it was just one of those people behaving badly moments, you know, it's like, okay. So that sort of set the, you know, that everybody's adrenaline was up after that, you know, <laughs> So that was a little weird to have to deal with, but it I, happens. Yeah, you know, we play uh, that gig that we had. That was a regular gig. Yeah, uh, was upstairs above. Actually, this particular building was upstairs, just above a stairwell. But but there were neighbors on either side, and we've had times where uh, we're sound checking about six thirty seven, yeah. and the business owners downstairs come up, you know, looking for that same that same conversation, you know, steam coming out of their, their collar and, you know, eyes red and, you know, walking with a purpose. And you can tell it's just going to be like, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're hired to play the music. Talk, talk to the people on the place. We're here to just do our job. Yeah. We're doing our thing. Like wh whatever we can do to accommodate needs to happen through, you know, the, the appropriate power channels. It's not, yeah. it's not our decision. We're doing what we are hired to do. If we stop, 
We are now and they don't understand that. They're no, just they don't. The closest person to take it out on. That's but, it. Uh, yeah. yeah. It was like, that's the guy with the volume. Knob. To be our sound guy. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, yep. for sure. Yep. Did you, yeah, how are no, your, just, you, how are your gigs, man? Um, last week. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> <laughs> I have this one winery gig that, um, is an interesting bag for me. A, they were the first people to hire me when I moved down to this new area. And I like the people. They're really nice. Um, but it's a just okay gig that took a little turn. So um, it's a, it's always a very, it, it's just me solo for this. So this is a story about me solo. Sure. Um, uh, it's a terrible tip place because the way that it's set up, I'm far enough away from the people who are listening that, it, it's awkward for them to walk that far if they can even see that I have a tip jar out. Right. right. And um, so it's been a terrible tip gig. It's on the lower end of the pay scale. And, um, but they've given me a, a fair amount of repeat business, right? So like I said, when I'm trying to just get started and say I have a place that is a regular gig and have a little scarcity in my schedule, I was grateful to take it and I'm grateful for the gig. Sure. But, you know, you start adding up kind of the, some of the factors. And then, you know, when I showed up for the gig this weekend, they had complaints from their neighbors <laughs> about sound. And this is just <laughs> sound and I'm just a solo guy, right? So they moved me inside. Uh, there's like a roll up door, you know, in this warehouse area, they moved me deeper into the, into the tasting room while most people on a nice day are sitting outside. So I played to almost nobody that on Saturday. Sucks. Almost. So, you know, it's a thing where it wasn't, Great. Like I said, it's a little bit on the low end of the pay scale, almost non-existent tips, now non-existent tips. And, you know, I guess it's just one of those things, you know, it's not, it's not, a per, you know, they're, they're doing what they think is okay. Right. Um, although one interesting thing about this gig, again, again, you kind of add up things and they, you know, start, you start to see a pattern. So this is a gig where um, I was requested to play all blues. Oh, Okay. Yeah, and so I was like, "You sure you want single solo acoustic blues for three hours? I mean, you sure that's the you know the vibe that you want?" He goes, "Yep, you know we want to be different than every other place. You know, other place, no country, absolutely no country. That'll get you fired." Um, and you know, there's plenty <laughs> of guys strumming classic rock stuff, and so he goes, "This is this is our vibe." And and I was like, "All right." So you know, I I was in for a dime, in for a dollar. So I learned a bunch of acoustic blues to play there, and. Um, but again, I put in a ton of time and then these other factors. And so it's kind of like one of those things where, well, you know, you think, I just wonder if that's a conversation you can have. I kind of feel like it's not. Because again, if your assumption is you're going to ask people to learn a, a three hour show for you. And, you know, I would hope that they understand where they are on the pay scale and they should know that they're not getting their musicians any tips, which they, sh you know, right. is kind of part of the deal, right? Right. You, what you, what, would, would you have the conversation where you just say it's clearly it is what it is and, you know, that that's what this gig is, take it or leave it? They might not be, um, they might not be aware of, of, of this as the scenario. Like they might not. They know their club, right? But they don't know what you experience at other clubs. Just like you don't know what other musicians experience there necessarily or what they experience from other musicians, right? Like you're both looking at this and seeing very different things, you know. Well, let, me just, let me, let me isolate it. the question, right? Yeah, okay. Would you as a musician communicate to someone, you know, you're kind of on the low end of the pay scale? Yeah, well, that's where, that's where I'm going with this is, is but thank you for getting me there, is yeah, they don't... <laughs> They don't know, right? Like, and and you could say yes, you know, the, the other place. I think they know because they asked me what I charged when we started, and I said something, and they came back and said and said, "Well, this is what we pay." Okay, so maybe what you say to them is say, "Hey, look, you know, I know that you know you're paying me less than, uh, than I get elsewhere because we had that conversation. What I didn't know coming into this was that." there was really no opportunity for tipping here. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, even at my standard rate, there is an expectation that I'll put out a tip jar and that tipping is a part of the scenario, especially for a solo acoustic guitar player. Like that's a, I would, I would say that that's a time honored, you know, tradition. It's well expected that if there's a solo act, 
there's a tip jar. Whether there's a tip jar with a band or not, things get a little, you know, wishy-washy. But certainly solo musician, tip jar, that's a normal thing. And you could say, I came in here with the expectation that that I would be able to earn tips in, in addition yeah. to the base that you're giving me. And that's not that's not possible because of the logistics here. You may not know this, right? Like it's it's <laughs> I know you wouldn't do this, right? But this is the conversation to have from a let me be helpful point of view as opposed to I pay taxes, you know. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> not, you know, that, you would, ever, not that, that you would ever not that you would like all conversations are good conversations. Yeah. If it's a respectful, you know, honest, direct thing. And you know, yes, it may end up in them saying take it or leave it, or you know, you know, sorry you feel we don't pay you fairly. You know, it, it, I guess it all it's fifty percent in the approach and fifty yes. percent the intent, right? Right. And so, right. you know, I guess all conversations are good. Um, you know, you, but if you choose to have the conversation, be prepared that, you know, you could get a, a variety of outcomes. Good, yeah, you're not going to get the answer or nothing. You're right. The answer that you want isn't, this isn't one of those things, right? What's the negotiating tactic is, you know, only answer a question that you know the answer to, or only mm -hmm. ask a question that you know the answer to. You don't get to do that in this particular scenario. You don't, you know, unless you know someone that's already had this conversation with them. Right. Uh, if, if you don't, then you have to go in knowing, just like you said, that the out, the outcome is not yours <laughs> to control. Yeah. 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 You can nudge it. Uh, you can ask, yep. there's nothing wrong with asking, especially if it's, you know, friendly and from, from a position of collaboration. Like I like playing here. I'd like to continue playing here, yeah, but I wonder, good. I wonder what we could do about this. And maybe the answer is, you know, I'm going to put the tip jar out there where the people are and maybe you could pass it around for me. You know, something like that. Throwing yeah. those kind of options, even if they are non-optimal for the party with whom you're having the conversation, it puts them in the position of coming up with an alternative. Right. Like you're saying, oh, like, like here we could do A, B or C. And they don't you, you, you know, darn well, they're not going to like A, B or C. Right. Uh, yeah. or, or a and B they're not going to like, but C is, or you could pay me more money. Like, Oh, okay. I see. Right. We're not going to want to hand around his tip jar for him. Maybe we should just pay him more money, you know, or yeah. option D, uh, thanks, but no thanks. You know, we'll, we'll yeah, call somebody I, I'm just else. kind of reflecting. You're saying it all makes sense, right? The trepidation is, do you, do, do you feel as though you're just talking about money is going to make things sensitive and they may, I mean, they but might. At yeah. the end of the day, do you want do you want to take the bad situation or do you want to right. try and make it better? Right. So I I guess that's the thing is like you know I a lot a lot of musicians take any gig don't or, you know it's very hard to say no because you don't know when the dry spell is going to come and I and I think that you you kind of train yourself to say yes and be protective. Yes. Um, and so you know I guess just hearing you talk it out, I should know this, right? You know, it's a conversation, and if you are respectful, you rarely will respectful and with good intent totally go south. No, it's right? it's not going to go south. But but it it is it, you know, negotiating is at some level a confrontation, right? You are bringing up something that you want from the other person, right? So you are confronting them and saying Hey, here's a thing I would like from you, right? Well, the art is to not make it feel like a confrontation. Well, that's right? the key. But you know, as the person who's going to bring up the money subject, and money is like, for most of us humans, especially most of us American humans, uh, but I, but, but probably else, elsewhere in the world too, uh, money is is a very quick path to confrontation, right? And so, um. I, you know, I, I get why a lot of musicians are hesitant to even ask it's like, Oh, well just give us whatever you can, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's fine. It's fine. We want to be friendly. We don't, we don't want to cause any troubles. We're just really happy to play here. Right. And as you and I know, and as we've talked about here, that leads to people playing, you know, for $12 and nachos. And, and then that <laughs> sours the market, um, you know, especially when the nachos aren't all that good. So yeah, I, I mean, it, but, but, like, like you said, you just, you just go in with the right attitude and then, then yes, it's a negotiation. Yes. Technically it's a confrontation, but you make it not feel like that. Like you make it feel well, like a collaboration. Well, here's the thing is just by bringing it up, you are letting them know that you are dissatisfied with something. Own, own that, you know, own just that. Yep. get your hands around that. Yes. You are bringing up a subject, but if you make, you know, if you think about how you don't want it to go, you don't want it to sound threatening. And I think what you said is right. I love playing at your place. Um, but you know, this last change with moving me inside, you know, was already not a, not a 
huge tip night for me. Now it's a non-existent tip night for me. Is there anything you think we can do about that? That's right. Because I really like playing here. Make it the, you know, the complaint yeah. sandwich, right? Like, you know. Yes. Put the- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did I just get? Did I just? Did I just share one of my secrets? Like, I mean, I that's, love it. but that's how you do it, right? I love playing here. I want more money. I'd really like to play here again. You know, you people are great. You know, whatever it is, like you know how to do that. Like that's yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, well, as long as we're on this topic and yeah, uh, and and uh, doing negotiations, I got a really interesting one for you. Okay, so I'm finding that where. I have moved to, they more often ask, what do you charge? Where I came from, it was like, here's what we pay. Yep. Okay. So the, the, we'll just put those as two facts on the wall. So yep. anyway, I got a, I've been trying to get a gig, running a guy down by email is, is the, is the method I've been using and finally get a hold of someone. He asked for um, some demos, sent me a note back, said, it sounds good. And I said, can I send you my availabilities? I'd actually want to you know, put that on the shelf because that's another thing to talk about as a, as kind of a tactic to a express that you are busy, that you are working, and that sure. your, you know, your schedule has finite amount of availability. We should talk now before this changes again. But the interesting thing that was is, um, uh, he said, "Yes, send me your availability. Let's get you some dates." And I sent him my availability, and in this email, I said, "And I charge X." And I haven't heard from him since, and he hasn't returned about four or five. So this is the question of, do you ask people what their budget is and then start negotiating around that? Do you just say what you charge and, you know, be prepared to live or die on that? How do you keep these conversations alive? And the, and the concerning thing about this was, is that a negotiation was moving along. And this is the only thing I can think of that killed it dead, dead, dead. And I don't know how far off we could have been because, you know, what, a hundred bucks or something like that. Yeah, right, I mean, right. How far off could I have been? But it did kill a conversation. So my question to you, oh, sage business negotiating, negotiating sandwich person guy, um, <laughs> is, is um, lead with your price or lead with asking what their budget is and then follow up with, well, I typically charge this and, you know, get into that conversation um, in these types of scenarios, is it better to, is it better to negotiate or is it better to stand by your price or build into your price some room? And again, if I would have built in more into this, assuming I was going to have to negotiate, um, I, you know, I definitely wouldn't have got a call back if, right. if that in fact is why this guy went away. So if you don't know, like I said, sometimes people will ask me right away, what's your, what do you charge? Right. Um, and sometimes people don't say anything if they don't say anything. So this is tricky, right? Because I'll I'll start with a slightly different example. When we are hiring someone for one of the businesses, I make sure that the salary, the money conversation, at least at a very, you know, general level happens in conversation number one, because I don't want to waste anybody's time, right? You know, if I can afford to pay you $40,000 a year, and that's what I've got carved out for this position. And you need $80,000 a year. That's a, like, we got to have that talk right up front that because th- otherwise we're just wasting each other's time. Right? right. So I like to talk about money up front. I've found it way easier. Everybody has it in the back of their head. It, it's definitely there. Nobody's going to come work for me for free. Conversation is going to happen. It's yeah. going to happen. We all know it. Right. So I, I always I, like, and it, it usually comes across as a relief. Like, Oh great. We're talking about this now. Awesome. Like, wow, you might be somebody that I could, I could work with. You're like, it's like, yeah, well, it's it's all a negotiation. You just don't realize what parts of it are happening at what times. And, and so, you know, the, the money thing, I do like to talk about it up front uh, just to take the sweat off. But what's we what the situation you're in is that you don't know that money you're making an assumption. Now it's an educated guess. Don't get me wrong, but you know, we all find ourselves there. I find this constantly in, you know, when we're bringing people on board that like, you know, that wants to want to sponsor the podcast or whatever, we have a conversation. It goes back and forth. They ask, what do you charge? I tell them what we charge. And then you don't hear from them. And it's like, okay, well then there's the, the Scott Jordan school of business. Scott's the, um, the, the guy, the Scott behind Scotty vest, the, the clothing company, And he has this mantra that is always be following up. And it, you know, I'm sure it makes him a pain in the neck sometimes. Uh, 
and I'm sure it makes me a pain in the neck. And I, I really try to stagger my follow-ups. I have this whole system that I use for follow-ups and I actually track it with, with email and things like that. But I use a service called SaneBox and their Sane Reminders feature, which is amazing. So I'll, I'll put that in the show notes because it's great. Um, but uh, uh, Sane Reminders, there it is. No, I won't forget. Um, but I would follow up with this person and just ask them. I don't, I, what you did makes perfect sense to me. Here's what I charge. There's nothing, like you said, it's going to come up at some point and you definitely want it to come up before you pack your stuff in the car and leave the house. Right. You don't want to put a gig on the schedule without knowing. So I would just ask him, say, Hey, uh, we were talking and I just wanted to know if you needed anything else from me or if there was, you know, something that came up, like what's going on. I, just ask that question and, and let them say, Oh, it was money. Oh, really? Okay, great. Let, let's talk about that. No problem. You know, so that's yeah. what I would do. So, yeah. Uh, I did that. Okay. And again, it went so cold. I was like, Hey, you know, we were on a roll and it seems like we had some good, you know, uh, momentum going here to get some bookings done. Yep. And then it just went totally stopped. I'm, it wasn't the fee that I charged. And I said, if so, you know, like I told you, I'm new in the area and I'm looking to get started. I'm happy to be flexible if, you know, we can come to an agreement. So put it out there that we can talk. Yeah. And away he went. So, away you know, went. well, it may, then yeah. it may not be money. You know, it could be that his business partner, he found out, you know, has, had been embezzling money and he's got bigger fish to fry. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, like, that's the thing is you, you don't, it sucks to have to guess. I hate it. And it happens more often than not in the business world. Like when something walks away, but they might just have all the information they need. And I've had those things, you know, to go back to the podcast ad thing. I've had those things where people come back three months later, a year later, and they're like, okay, we're ready. It's like, what? okay. Like, could you have answered my emails over the past, you know, 12 months? Like just say, oh, we're not ready to make a decision yet. Okay. Well, when will you be? Can I, you know, can I ask you next quarter? Is that okay? Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. You know, the, so, but it's The sucks. booking conversation is just an interesting thing. Um, our friend, Adam Johnson over at Cover Band Confidential. Yeah. He says, my price is my price. And you know, if you're not going to meet yeah. my price, we're going to do it. You know, I think most musicians, Look at it as a most semi-professional musicians look at it as an airline seat. Like, all right, you know, a Friday or a Saturday night, I'm probably going to be able to book it for why. So I know I don't have to take a, you know, a low ball thing on a weekend date. Right. Um, and, you know, I'm going to make, you know what, a, uh, in hotels, you know what a yield manager is? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yield managers, their job is to look historically like, uh, you know, a Wednesday in the fall in Boston, everybody comes to see the leaves change. We're going to do well. We're going to raise up the price of our hotel room. They kind of see the trends of what to charge night by night by night by night. Crazy. If, if, if the hotel isn't full, how much do you discount it, you know, to get it full? And, and when do you pull the trigger on that? That's what a yield manager does. And kind of as musicians, we kind of are doing that all the time, right? Yeah, we have a bunch of airline seats. The difference between most musicians and most yield managers is a, most yield managers know that that's what their job is. Whereas most musicians <laughs> think, think that their job is playing music. You know, that's what you get to do after you, being a yield manager and a negotiator and an equipment hauler. Right. Yeah. You know, um, but, and, and yield managers, the other difference is most of them have also gone to school at some level to be trained to be yield managers. Whereas most musicians are truly, you know, a flying by the seat of their pants and b fueled by this desire to perform. And, and yes. that is such, it's what an Achilles heel to, yeah. to our ability. to. Like negotiate. I said, we tend to not want to turn anything away. That's I, right. I would actually give most people who book bands that they have developed some innate sense of their value, mm. the marketplace value, you know, the value of a Friday night in the summer, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, whether, whether there's a form, uh, you know, a yield manager formulation to this or whether just instinctively they're saying, no, you know, we're, we're not going to go out, you know, for, for a hundred dollars a man on a weekend, you know, I, I think I feel pretty good about our chances to book something better. And you, you might turn that down, but on a Tuesday night, you know, Hey, everybody, we got this offer. Seems like nice people, you know, they seem to love us a lot. This is all they can afford. Uh, would you guys rather play? Would you guys rather, you know, stay home is a conversation. I think many bands have yeah. on, on a regular basis when a gig offer comes in. Right. That's right. So, so, you know, this, this whole process of, of, putting it through a formal or informal thought process, you know, as to how you evaluate a gig. Uh, like I said, you know, the house rockers generally, not always, but I'd say 75% of the time 
we get asked what our rate is, especially for corporate and, and, and weddings, right? That's for fair. that type of thing, yeah. what do you charge? Clubs will tell you what they pay, and you get to choose whether that's that's good for you or not. Right. And what you know, and, right. again, for musicians, like you said, a, a desire to perform is one thing. I think kind of innate an innate uh, drive to um, have bookings, create momentum, increase your audience. You know, there's a lot of other things that go into the subjective decisions to take or not take a gig. Will it be fun? Will they give us food? Is it, you know, something that might lead to something else? Right. You know, there's a lot of other things that go into it. But yeah, I, I ran headlong into this, um, you know, good negotiation by email, um, created some demand, you know, stated my qualifications, um, shared an update, at, you know, when I didn't get any responses for a while, yep. sent a new video and said, hey, here's something I did last weekend, so we'd love to play for you. Finally got a response, and then it just went absolutely cold. And you're right. It's a little weird, right? How how far off can, could we have been to not at least have a discussion yeah, about there's, it? There, Unless I, he was put off that you're not going to tell me what you charge, which would be strange if the guy's in business. But um, right. you know. Well, that's the thing, right? Like, I, I doubt it, but if that is the attitude, then you just dodged a bullet. Yeah, I guess so. I, I mean, but it probably isn't. It's probably something entirely different. Um, and, and so I, I recommend that everybody create their RFC list. Uh, and that is your reasons for contact list. And don't think that you will remember all of these create a spreadsheet. And in one column, you're going to list all the reasons for contact. So you have the new video, you have, I learned some blues songs. You have like anything. It doesn't matter. Here's my summer schedule. I have one date available. I would love to play your place. Like all of those things. And then, uh, you know, in the rows across the top, or you do it either way, it doesn't matter. You put the club, right? The, or the booking agent, however the case may be. And then in the cell that matches your reason for contact and the booking agent, you put the date so that you know the last time you used that reason with that agent or that manager of that club. And then you can, you know, reuse those over time. But it's the, the RFC list allows you an excuse to contact people when it might otherwise be awkward for you to just check in and say, Hey, yeah. are you going to book me? Right. Because well, they get a, they also get a thousand emails a day from people saying, right. Hey, just checking in. That's right. Just checking in is not a reason to respond. It's not. It, yeah. You'll, you don't put that down on your RFC list. That doesn't count. That's right. Yeah. Just checking in is only if you really expect, like the person said, I'm going to call you tomorrow. And then it's two days later and they haven't called you. That's one of those times where you can just check in. Right. But otherwise you got to create this system that makes it feel like, you're out there doing stuff with or without them and you want to, you know, maybe give them a little bit of FOMO. Like, wait, what am I missing out? Yeah. Who, who is this person? I've heard from them exactly. four times. They're doing all these things. Everybody else is just checking in with me. I want to talk also, to that guy. It, well, that's it. And also it, you know, it, depending on how you write it or, you know, what your process is, whether you call or if you drop in, sure, it demonstrates that you're a serious professional. That's it. That's correct. Yeah. If they notice it, then they, you, yes, exactly. Yep. I think so. I think it's good. All right. That's what I got for today. You got anything else, man? No, nope. good, right. good stuff. Like I said, the, the stuff just kind of popped up. I enjoy the process of just kind of processing these things. No, it's good it's to process. Helpful. Yeah. Cause we're all in this together. That's what this is. I mean, that's what gig gab is about, man. It's great. Agreed. Yeah. Feedback so, at giggabpodcast.com. I want to make sure you folks send in your stuff to us, please. Please. And then, you know, if everybody wouldn't mind holding a, a glass up to the sky and wishing my great friend Steve Strong, my bass player, you know, luck and success in his travels. I would appreciate it, folks. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, cheers to Steve for sure. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I will. I will share. In fact, you know what? I'll put it in the episode image. Matt, our guitar player, took some some pictures from our vantage point uh, of our gig on Saturday night, our, our chafe gig. So I'll share one of those so you can see what it looks like to us. What, uh, for those of you that, that I know that we have quite a few listeners who aren't on stage, here's what you look like out there. So check out the episode image that comes from Saturday. These, these are not photos of people flashing you, right? No, 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 no. Those, <laughs> those we don't share. <laughs> Actually, I don't think we have any of those. So, uh, but yeah, no, no, these are, these are, these are all family friendly photos. So, yep. <laughs> Way to go. Yep. Take it easy folks. And, uh, we'll see you next week. What's that thing we say? Always be performing. Oh, and always be following up, too.